here today. Exodus chapter 30. And can we just stand as we read the Word of God? And I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. And uh, Exodus and chapter 30. It says, And thou shalt make an altar uh, to burn incense upon the shittim wood. Uh, thou shalt make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. And the horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof. And thou shalt make, it, um, make unto it a crown of gold round about. And two golden rings shalt thou make uh, to it under the crown of it by the two corners thereof. Unto the two sides of it uh, shalt thou make, make it. And they shall be uh, for places for the uh, staves to bear with all. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put uh, it before the veil, which is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat uh, that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn incense, uh, shall burn there, there, in, there on sweet incense every morning. Uh, when, thou, when he um, dresses the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereupon, uh, nor burnt sacrifice, uh, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron sh uh, uh, shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year with the blood of a sin offering and atonement once in the year shall he make atonement for, for it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. I want to talk about light the incense. Let's have a word of prayer tonight. Father, thank you for the chance to be at this good church. We pray for Emmanuel Baptist Church, Lord. They're, uh, Lord, they're just in a great area with great opportunities and I believe open doors. They're, they have a great missions program reaching around the world. And their pastor preaches uh, revivals a lot, Lord, and they've got a growing area, Lord. And I just pray specifically for this church to have your hand upon it, for wisdom about the building. I know they need that, Lord, and I pray you'd guide them uh, to the next step uh, to meet the needs and, uh, and to uh, uh, fit everybody. And uh, we pray you'd whatever they build or wherever they move or whatever happens, Lord, that uh, it would be insufficient after a while and you'd fill it again. Uh, we pray that you would uh, continue to work in a mighty way. Lord, we just have a, a few minutes here this evening, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. Without you, we can do nothing. We pray that the Holy Spirit would lead and guide us into all truth, and we would rightly divide the word, and you'd speak to us. We pray tonight and make an impact in our lives, Lord, as this message um, is something that can really change some lives, and I pray that it would in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. There was... Uh, <clears throat> In the tabernacle and then the temple, there's pieces of furniture you had outside the brazen altar where the sacrifices were, were, were done, and then you had inside, um, you had several pieces of furniture, you know, all the way from the uh, Ark of the Covenant at the farthest inside the, uh, the temple, the tabernacle, and you had, you know, the, um, the altar of incense, which we're talking about tonight, you had the table of showbread and the and the golden candlestick and, and different things. all And they all symbolize things. Uh, most of them, uh, if not all of them, are talking about Jesus and, and pointing to Jesus. Even the veil, the big curtain that was between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple, that veil was a picture of uh, the flesh and, uh, and the separation between God and man that was there. And Jesus, when he died, the veil was, was uh, ripped in half, showing that we now have direct access to God. Um, so all there, it's all, it's, there's just symbolism all over inside there. And, and one piece that's not talked about much is this altar of incense. This altar of incense is 18 inches by 18 inches, just a few feet high, has uh, horns on the corner. It's overlaid with gold, and it's, it's just a, a small uh, a piece of furniture. If you, were, if you were starting out here and you were able to go in, which you wouldn't be able to, um, but, but if you could go into the, the temple, um, you'd walk into it and you would see the furniture, um, all the different things, a table of showbread would be on one side and, and, uh, and, and, and all these different things. And you get toward the curtain there, and when you almost got the curtain right before the curtain, the veil, because right behind the veil was the Ark of the Covenant, 
with the mercy seat on it. And you can only go in there once a year, only the high priest one time a year. He could go back there because that's where God dwelt, was right there, okay? And so right before you got the curtain, basically against the curtain is this altar of incense. And it's very important. It's actually called part of the most holy place, okay? And, and it's called, you know, part of that, the very sacred place where, where God dwells, even though it's outside the curtain, it was outside there, but that was this, this, uh, this piece of furniture. And, uh, and, and it was supposed to be lit every morning and every evening. It had a, a, a potpourri of different uh, 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 spices and, and incense. It was the altar of incense. And you'd light those, those, um, those things. And Aaron was the one to do it, okay? There were priests who did other things. But Aaron was the high priest. And only Aaron lit the altar of incense. Aaron, the high priest, was a picture of Christ. And, and that's all over Hebrews. We don't have time to uh, talk about that. But, but, but he was the high priest. <clears throat> and it says Aaron specifically is supposed to light this morning and night. And is supposed to constantly, constantly be lit and smoking and bringing up that smell, that incense up there. Always supposed to be doing that 24-7. And, uh, and it's supposed to be like that. Some things God had constant. You know, the... Uh, the, 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 the candle was supposed to be lit 24-7. Because of the neglect, for example, in 1 Samuel chapter 1 with Eli and his sons, um, the, it says, ere, the, 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 ere the, the flame of God, the fire of God went out. You know, they were neglecting their job and that, that was a symbolism of the presence of God in Israel forever. And the, it, it was about to go out because of the neglect. And, and, and it was a symbolism of God's presence is almost done here. But one woman had a broken heart and prayed and, and, and brought in Samuel and kept the fire lit. This altar of incense was also never supposed to stop. Never supposed to stop. It was always supposed to be burning. And, uh, and, and put those mixtures in there, make sure it was lit, and, and it would just smoke uh, constantly. And it was a very sacred thing. We, we can read there in verse 8. It says, And when Aaron lighted the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generation. And so it's supposed to always be lit. It was very sacred. It was a very sacred thing. Let me just swing it. Keep there in Exodus, but I'm going to, I'm going to go to uh, Hebrews. And I'll be in Hebrews a few times. If you want to turn there, you can. But Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So now you're talking about the holiest of all place at the very front of the tabernacle, which had the golden censer. And the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein um, was the golden pot of manna, and then Aaron's rod that budded, and the, t and the tables of covenant. And over it, uh, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, uh, which, of which we cannot now speak particularly. He's talking about all these things there, and he mentions there, of course, this incense, the altar of incense, as part of that sacred sacred spot there in verse 3 <clears throat> and verse 4. It's the holiest of all. This is the very important thing. This is very important to God. Now, what is this altar of incense? What is it symbolizing? What it's all about? The altar of incense is a symbol for us for prayer. Okay? It is a symbol of prayer in the Bible. Let me just take you to Psalms 141. I'm going to give you several verses just showing you that God talks about the altar of incense is prayer to God. Psalm 141. <clears throat> Psalm 141, and we'll turn to a few other verses. In verse 1, Lord, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me, give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, incense and the lifting up of my thanks as evening sacrifice. Let my prayer be like an inc incense that's being lit and is coming up before, before you a sweet-smelling savor. Let me take it to Revelation in chapter 5. You'll see it again. And just showing you that this altar of incense is a symbol of prayer of God's people. Revelation chapter 5. And again, I'm going to swing back to Exodus uh, uh, later. And uh, verse 
8. It says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every, every one of them harps and golden veils uh, full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Okay, there we, we see this again. And then chapter 8 in Revelation. And verse 1, and we'll read another passage later that shows it again. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in the heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood uh, before God, and to them was given uh, seven trumpets. <clears throat> and another angel uh, came and stood at the altar, having the golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer with it the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the, the prayer of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and a great earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So you see that we see this again. It's the same thing. It's the altar of incense, the prayer of saints. And it's just smoke. Just rising up. It's just constant. It's just rising up there all the time. I wrote a statement down because I, you know, I, I was, uh, when, I, when I, I got saved at 16, I got saved out of the world. And, and, but I was always a loner. I was always a quiet person. I was always a person who liked being alone. And when I got saved, uh, prayer was very natural to me because I was very nat normally alone. And, and I, I used to spend every, every night I'd go up to uh, an area in a park near my house. I would just sit and look at stars and think for two or three hours. And, and that turned into my prayer time because I, I, I just loved to talk to God. I just, it just happened there. And, and I started praying as, 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 you know, as a 16-year-old. And now all these, you know, 10 years later or whatever it is, um, <clears throat> here I am. And I've st I'm still learning about prayer. And prayer is such an incredibly deep thing. There's so much to it, but very few people really know much about prayer. Very few people really have a depth of knowledge about prayer. And one of the things that, that the shallow, and I, if you pray in a shallow way, I'm glad you pray. Good, pray. If all, all you can do is, is just ask for things, that's the shallowest form of prayer. But I'm glad you do it, and God's glad you do it. Do it. Okay, it'll grow into something else. But in all that time, <clears throat> and you kind of learn that prayer is not just, here I am, Lord, Lord, I ask this, 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 in Jesus' name, amen. But it's, it's something that's, that's rising. It's something before God a lot. And it's, it's, a, it's a smoke. It's an incense. It's a, it's a, it's a smell. It's a... It's a sweet-smelling savor that comes to God. Sometimes prayer is not a brick through heaven's window, but a notice ambiance that makes a difference. As I learn and, and, and pray and try to get better at it, <clears throat> I, I before was like, I want this answer. I prayed, I did this and this and this. And as you mature in prayer, the, pra the, the answer is good. And the, prince, the answer is important. Prayer means to ask, okay? It's, part, it's, it's huge. But the time with God is, you start learning, you know what? You, you're using my selfishness of, want, of want, wanting something to spend time with me, aren't you? It's like when you, your, 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 your child wants a piece of candy you have, and you say, yeah, come on here, I'll give you a piece of candy. And as soon as they get close enough, you nab them and hug them and put them on your lap. They came to you for the candy, you, 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 but you want to snuggle. Right. Good. Good. Okay? And, <clears throat> you know, Matthew 6 says God knows what we need before, right. you know. Right. Your father knows you have need of these things. Right. It's not like you go and say, Lord, please pay my bill. I'm short on my bill. And God says, oh, really? Oh, oh, angels. No, why didn't anybody tell me? You know, that's, that's not what's happening in heaven. But you have to pray. Sure. You have not because you ask not. Right. You know, James tells us. But prayer is more. The, it, he symbolized it with a 24-7 rising of smoke into his presence. Just floating up there. 
And it's, it, it's, it's, it's not you just come in and shout something at God and get him to do something. He's not a genie. Right, right. And, and, and that's not what the Lord is. Right. And a mature prayer life, there's going to be prayer, prayer, there's going to be asking in there. But if you ever look at the Lord's, you know, the sample prayer, the Lord's prayer, we call it, <clears throat> you know, if you look at what he taught, look at how much of it is asking for yourself. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and earth it is in heaven. Have you prayed for anything yet? Give us this day our daily bread. Okay, there's a prayer request. Okay, wasn't for a million dollars. Wasn't for a new, you know, new truck. But give us our daily bread. And that, that's enough. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Okay, and forgive us our, yeah. Forgive our sins. That's good. Confession's part of part of your prayer life. Be confession, okay? And 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 lead us not into temptation. There's a prayer request for the spiritual life. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There's a lot of worship. There's a lot about God's glory and His will being done. A lot of other things going on there about the kingdom of God. Do you ever pray for God's kingdom to come? It's 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 part of that short little list of things they pray for. Even so come Lord Jesus is all of the New Testament. Okay, and 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 so that it it's it's it represents a prayer of the saints and it's not that you're you know walking up, knocking on the door, God opens the door, okay, here's my request. Got it? Okay, bye. That's that's not what prayer in the Bible is. It symbolizes an altar with 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 a smoke rising that's always lit. And Maybe you're just talking to God. You know, sometimes when you have really, you know, maybe get to the, 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 the PhD level of prayer, sometimes you're, you and God are connected right then, and you're kind of, you know, like you're, you've been married long enough. You're kind of talking, you're communicating, but you're not really saying anything. You're just, you're together. But you can be together and not be me talking. And, and, and that's, that's probably something that uh, we could grow up in, in prayer is, is, is like that. <clears throat> prayer has to be done, and, and we have to pray. Do you understand if, you know, I found out in Bible college, I was in a dorm floor with 110 guys, and a good Bible college, all of them training for the ministry, and as we got to know the guys, and uh, I was out praying one night, and one of the guys came to me and started asking me some questions about about you know, some spiritual things. You're really struggling with some things. And I said, why are you, basically I said, as a freshman, I said, why are you talking to me? And he says, because you're one of the only guys who prays. And I thought, is that really true? And I started checking it out. And we found out on, on a dorm floor of 110 guys training for the ministry, two of them had a significant prayer life. Those are guys training for the ministry. I'll, I find that pastoring for, you know, 20, I'm going to have to pastor and I remember 26, 28 years. I don't know. I forget. And uh, <clears throat> in, those, in those years of pastoring people, I find that I can get them on track Bible reading a lot easier than prayer. I can get them faithful to church. And, you know, not me, it's God. But, you know, with working with people and discipling. And work, I find that these things are a lot easier. But getting a, a real prayer life going is a struggle. I think the devil fights it harder. Everybody says, I would love, yeah, I want to have a prayer life, Pastor. But every time I start to pray, <laughs> yeah, something comes up. Yeah, or you're too busy or you're too tired. All of a sudden, you know, this happens. Or, well, it's not an accident. Right. Someone once said, the devil laughs at our studies and mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Yeah. You know, a preacher can preach a great sermon and... <clears throat> be a great pulpiteer, but if he's not walking with God, there's no life going to be changed. Right. You know, you're, without prayer, forget it. <laughs> I mean, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're laboring in vain. Prayer has to be done. You know, Luke at 18, 1, we'll be in that chapter later, men ought always to pray and not to faint. <clears throat> Let's go there. Let's go to Luke 18 and just look at a couple things there. Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> it 
You can pray for my voice. I have to clear my throat a lot. I have, I have they found uh, vocal, I have, my vocal cords are inflamed and there's problems there. If you can pray for that, uh, we have some issues there. I'm still able to do everything I need to do, but it's, uh, if you can pray about that, that's why I clear my throat. Uh, look at Luke 18. There's a parable about prayer starting there. Verse 1, the men ought always to pray and not to faint. And there was a judge which feared not God or man. And there was a widow in that city. And she said to him, avenge me, my adversary. And he would not, but, he, but she kept praying. She kept asking. And eventually she got it. Is the parable we'll read later. Notice she's saying, avenge me, my adversary. That's not an accident that this woman who's representing Christians and God who's representing the judge, when you're doing that, she's saying, avenge me, my adversaries. My adversaries hurt me. He's wounded me. He's, 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 he's got me in trouble. He's, he stole from me. Who's your adversary? Who's your adversary? First Peter 5.8. Be sober, be vigilant, your adversary, the devil. And he says, you want to be avenge your adversary, prayer. You can't fail at this thing. But here's what happens. The adversary comes and, and, and he steals from you. He stole your child away. He stole your friend away from God. He stole your city, your nation. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. And <clears throat> we come and we pray, Lord, my, my, my person I was sitting next to a church, Lord, this person loved you and they were serving you, and now they're off in the world. <clears throat> this teenager from our church is off in sin. <clears throat> it's not just that teenager. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. There's a spiritual war. And your adversary has wronged you. And he's stolen from you. And he's destroying. And we go and he pray, Lord, bring them back. And then you stop. Because they're not coming back. They didn't come back. It's been two years now. And they're really doing wrong. And they're really messed up. The devil says, yeah, why don't you quit praying about it? It's not going to happen anyway. And the altar of incense quits being lit. And you say, why? Why don't you see backsliders that come back to church? And they'd come back and they'd get right with God. And you'd have the prodigal return and the whole church would celebrate. Why doesn't that happen anymore? Because you used to have saints of God who wouldn't quit praying. Those old prayer warriors that are almost gone now. They're like pit bulls, man. When they started praying for you, they, they were, they were going to pray that thing through. But now we got people who are in there like, lit the incense. All right. Done. We're supposed to just keep on letting this thing float up all the time. And to have a persistent prayer life is not a, amen, that's awesome. But, we got to have it. Amen. We got to have it. And it takes diligence. Yes, you got to light that thing every morning and every evening. Is there, is there still, is, there, is incense still in there? Is it still lit? Sometimes you, you have it in there and it's, it goes out. Sometimes you lit it and sometimes it all of a sudden it burnt up fat. You got you to be on it. Number two, the Lord likes constant prayer. Let's go back there to Exodus in chapter 30. <clears throat> and it'll be in Luke 18 also. Well, I'll just quote it to you. But Exodus chapter 30, the Lord likes constant prayers. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 7, And Aaron shall burn, uh, burn uh, thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. It's perpetual and it's forever. Constant prayer. Luke 18, 1. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. That's why I symbolize it that way. And I, I think you should have a prayer time. Okay, well, that'll be the last point there. But, <clears throat> but 
all the time. Just be sending it up. Sometimes you're talking to someone and you're saying, Lord, I don't have the answer here. And you send it up there. And you're getting your car and you wake up in the morning. And when you're going to bed at night, Lord, thank you for this day. And Lord, I just thank you for another day. And Lord, I, and, and, and I got a burden for someone right now that's really uh, broken my heart. And I just, every, I just decided instead of worrying and, and thinking, man, was, I just decided every time I think I'm going to pray about it. It's just so much better. Because worrying does nothing. If worrying solved problems, I could change the world. Worrying does nothing. Literally, you're wasting your time. All you're doing is making your health bad. That's all you're doing. You're messing up your stomach. You can worry all day long. It changes nothing. You worry, you're, you worry about your mortgage payment. It, you know, all of a sudden, you're the, you know, Bank of America calls and says, you know, we just found out you're worrying. <clears throat> and we're just not going to, we're just painting this thing off, man. You can worry all day long and look in your wallet. There's no more money there. Worry about your check engine light. The check engine light doesn't go off because you're worried about it. Praying. Always praying, praying without ceasing. It's just constantly there. And we always have that there. And we always stay there with that. You know, it's strange that it says, when it, people always talk about the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, and it's good. And they, they always finish up generally. They, they start with the armor of God. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, I think verse 12, and they go through. And they get down to about verse 16, 17, and it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, where we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And that's the armor of God. It stopped. It didn't stop. They just stopped. The next verse says, I think it's verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. It's part of the spiritual battle. Just like the Word of God and faith and all these things. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Look, the Apostle Paul says, and, pray, and for me, the next verse. That I may make, open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel of Christ. He says, look, I need prayer that I'll preach boldly. And the Apostle Paul needed boldness. You know, that's probably why some people say, I just can't do it. I can't witness. I'm so afraid and I'm so embarrassed. Yeah? <laughs> Welcome to humanity. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy to walk up and tell someone that you're a sinner and you're going to go to hell. It's not easy. It's not fun. <clears throat> Who wants to do that? But with prayer, praying for boldness. God, help me. Lord, help them. Lord, give them boldness. Pray for your preacher, for he'd have boldness when he preaches. I mean, he'll stand up there and say, bless God, whatever the Bible says, and, and he'll do that. But you know there's pressure. And there's things, you know, sometimes you're going to lose some people when you preach that. And you got to have boldness. And, and praying for these things matters. <clears throat> The Lord just likes those constant prayers. You symbolize it with the altar of incense. And we've got to have that. And we have to pray. And you can't make excuses for it and expect to be blessed. We're not supposed to be defeated. We're not supposed to be losing. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But without prayer, we're going to lose. But most people don't pray. Because we're, we're in the rat race of America. I'm just telling you, as a person who travels the whole world and goes to a lot of primitive places, people in simple, quiet cultures do not have a problem praying. You're walking behind a mule and plowing a field. There's nothing else to look at. There's nothing else to do, right? You have to walk two hours to work you're plowing a field or cutting rice or whatever you're doing. But us, as soon as you get a second of quiet, I, I can't. You know, most, most people are addicted to their phones. They're actually, they're actually the, the, the psychological society, you know, the, they're actually diagnosing it now. 
once I started, they started talking about the signs of it, I started laughing. I'm saying, yeah, it's a comfort. Sure. They constantly touch it. Sure. First thing in the morning. Just like people used to be with alcohol. <coughs> You know, you leave your house. And it doesn't matter you're late. If you would do that with your prayer life. I haven't prayed. Oh, have I prayed? But constant prayer is something God wants, but it's <clears throat> very hard in a, when you got every kind of entertainment in your car and you can turn everything on and you got your cell phone, you got all this stuff, people are always calling you, you know, you're a pastor, I know what it's like, calls in all hours, and, and you're busy and you got a lot of things going on, but God likes constant prayer. And you're not going to have victory. And God doesn't say, well, you know, I'm going to give a waiver for people who have cell phones because, you know, that's just different then. <clears throat> I don't expect them to pray. Number three, um, we said, number one, uh, it represents prayer of the saints. Number two, the Lord likes constant prayer. Number three, prayers are because of atonement. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 30. Prayers are because of atonement. <clears throat> Verse 10, and Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of the altar once a year with the blood of the sin, off, uh, sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout all your generations. Uh, uh, it is most holy unto the Lord. <clears throat> now watch this. Verse 9, you shall offer no strange incense thereupon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering. Neither shall you pour drink offerings thereon. So, if this is the stage of the tabernacle, for you know, if we were out, outside the tabernacle here, we walk inside and we're going to get the Holy of Holy o over there and the altar of incense by the speaker. And if the, if the keyboard there is, is the Holy of Holies, the, the altar of incense is by the Christmas tree of the speaker there. We're outside of it. Outside of the temple is where they do the sacrifices. There's a brazen altar out there, an altar of sacrifice. They kill the animals there. They take the blood in here and sprinkle the blood and do their things. But inside here <clears throat> is, and he says specifically, on the altar of incense, don't do any, it's an altar, right. don't do any sacrifices on that. Right. Okay? I don't want blood sacrifices, animal sacrifices, I don't want water sacrifices. He said, I don't want any sacrifices on that. Because the sacrifices are done out there. And when you come in here and when you're praying, I don't want you thinking about sacrifice. That is not a thing that's done. It's already done. The, it's already been finished, the sacrifice has. The altar of incense is there because the sacrifice is done out there. <clears throat> Your prayer life is allowed into God's presence because the sacrifice of Christ was already done. But a lot of people come to the altar of incense with their sacrifice and they come with their guilt and they come with their insecurity and they come thinking I can't be here and they start trying to do some kind of pendant, penance in their prayer they're, they're at sacrifice stage of the altar of incense where they should be sending up the sweet smell to God because the sacrifice was already done Hebrews 4 says this beautifully it says wherefore come boldly to the throne of grace This place is, and, and I, you have to reprogram most Christians on this, is understand, Ephesians 1.6 says, you are, ex, you are made accepted in the beloved. Because you kind of come to God and kind of think, well, I know who I am, I know what I've done. And you know, when I come to God, I know God's kind of frowning, looking down at me and saying, you? <sighs> oh, man. Oh, I guess I'll listen to some of the things you say, but I'm really kind of mad at you about this. Kind of angry about, you know. <clears throat> and because of that, your prayer has no faith. Because you're still at the altar of sacrifice, doing a sacrifice in the altar of incense. 
not understanding the power of the blood of Christ. As far as east is from the west, so far I have to remove our transgressions from us. And if you would come boldly understanding, you're at the altar of incense now, celebrating the joy. Because God wants you there going, this is great. This is wonderful. Thank you. You hear my prayers. Thank you. Because literally he says, <clears throat> that veil was torn in half. And when you pray, come boldly to the throne of grace. You walk into the Holy of Holies when you pray. Right. You're before the throne of God. But what about what if <laughs> you're not you're 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 here you are doing a sacrifice. You don't love Jesus as much as you could because we love him because he first loved us. You have some incomplete mindset of salvation where you think you think, yes, he saved me, I'm going to heaven, but I'm not really forgiven. God's still kind of holding some grudges. And so you don't really understand how deep his love was and how great his sacrifice was. You don't really fall in love with him that much. And you don't pray with any kind of boldness because you're doing a sacrifice at the altar of incense instead of just lighting a sweet-smelling savor. And understand you have access by faith, Hebrews tells us. And there's so many chapters of Hebrews about this, but we have these things. Let's go to Hebrews and let's just look at a couple verses there. <clears throat> Enjoy your prayer life. God paid a great price to make it so you and him could just talk. And you can just, just pour out your heart before him, 1 Peter 5, 7. You mean I can just tell God all my, everything? Yeah, everything. Pour out your heart before him, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you, 1 Peter 5, 7. You can give him everything. He says, you're before my throne. You're standing here talking to me. Talk to me. I don't know. I, you know, it's me. Hebrews 4, <clears throat> verse 15. Uh, where, uh, if we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He says, I know what it's like. Come boldly. To the throne of grace. You're coming to the throne right now. You just walked into the Holy of Holies. And if I were God and I opened up the Holy of Holies to a human and said, come on in and talk to me. Come boldly. And they said, uh, I know you're still holding. I just, get out of here. Go back to sacrifice and figure out if, I'm, if I saved you to the uttermost or not. Because I already paid the debt, and you're walking up, sitting there saying, well, let me pay you some money, and maybe you'll, you'll, you'll listen to me. And said, your, your debt's paid. Well, I feel kind of like it really isn't. Let me just kind of do this, because I don't want to talk to you openly about this stuff until I really feel like you're... <laughs> you're at the wrong altar. Right. <laughs> you're at the wrong altar. Sure. Hebrews 7. <clears throat> And verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing of, of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. Right. Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. You say, but I, that's why. Because your faith is in you. <laughs> it's like when you witness to somebody, how are you going to heaven? Well, I am done. I already know the answer. <laughs> you're trusting you. If the answer is not Jesus for your salvation, then you got the wrong salvation. And when you're coming to God and saying, but I am, it's not you. The full assurance of faith, no wonder you have doubts because you, you, the, you're not going to have full assurance of faith if you're looking at yourself. And who do you think the accused of the brethren is who's sitting there telling you, reminding you all, why do you think of that when you go to pray? Good. Now listen, I think as you confess your sin, 1 John 1, 9. And then believe that God forgives us our sins. and clean. It's a matter of faith. Either he forgave you or he didn't. There isn't like this, you know, 99% forgiven, but you still got that stain there. I can still see it if I look close enough. 
God's mercy is not the chalkboard where you can still see what the teacher wrote, but they erase it and you still see it, sort of. That's not salvation. That's not God's forgiveness. It's complete to the uttermost. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansed us from all sin. And you have to believe that. Come with the full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. It's the way we're supposed to pray. <clears throat> so many pray with guilt, not boldness. Because they don't believe when God said, Ephesians 1, 6, I've made you accepted in the beloved. Now, if you have sin, the Bible says God will reveal it to you. You have the Holy Spirit inside. If you have the scripture, it tells you what your sin is. Confess it. And when you're done, enjoy the freedom to walk into God's throne and talk to God and obtain help. You're sitting there talking. You're in his throne room. And quit thinking about yourself so much. Spend more time thinking about God and his mercy and his power. <clears throat> Prayers are because of atonement. Don't think that the altar of incense is a, is a sacrificial altar outside. It's not that. It's the place of prayer and enjoy that. God wants to spend time with you. He invites you to come boldly to his throne of grace. There's something about the Lord that wants to be with you. Prayer is part of that, and he'll bless your prayers and work in your life. But uh, as you come along, you'll just find, you know, I'm just hanging out with God. Your prayers, praise time might start becoming longer than your prayer time. You might start finding out that I can pray about everything I need pretty quick. And man, I just, I'm going to pray for some other people. I'm going to spend some time giving glory to God. I'm going to thank Him. I'm going to love on God and, and, and do that. Next, prayer should be separated. Back, back to Exodus 30. <clears throat> prayer should be separated. We doing good? Okay, good. Exodus chapter 30. Let's go down to verse 34, same chapter there. By the way, the, the, the sacrifice, and, you know, it's talked about um, earlier in chapter 27 about the sacrifice you do outside. The altar of incense in chapter 30 has nothing to do with that. There's no sacrifice on the altar of incense. It's not allowed. Exodus 30 and verse <clears throat> 34. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto these sweet smices, spices, uh, stacti, and all, if I say, I'm going to say them confidently so you, you'll think I'm right if, if I'm saying it wrong. Um, and on, Oncha and uh, Gabalum, uh, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall, you, uh, uh, shall be uh, like weight. So equal amounts of all these. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apocryphary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small, and put it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet thee, it shall be unto you most holy. So that's the, that's the, that's the formula. He just gave him an exact formula, okay? Okay, he gives him that formula. <clears throat> and he tells him what it's supposed to be like. Now watch this, verse 37. And as for the perfume... Um, which thou shalt make, ye shall not make it to yourselves. According to the composition thereof, it shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make, make like unto that to smell thereunto shall even be cut off from his people. Whoa. So if you understand, if you understand the Old Testament, you, you were part of the congregation, that was like salvation. It's that if you make that mix for your own house, you're kicked out of the Israel, the congregation. Yeah. You can't come to the temple anymore. You can't do sacrifice. It's like losing your salvation in the Old Testament. Like He says, this is the mix for God. It's a separate thing. Right. But I like the smell. It doesn't matter. Right. It's not for you. It's holy unto the Lord. Right. It's separated. Your prayer and your worship is just for the Lord. Amen. It's just for the Lord. But we depend and we almost say prayers to people. 
we become more dependent and more trusting in the power of man and people, and we give glory to people, and all these things are for God. Are for God. My glory will I not give to another. And and these your prayer is not to saint, it's not to Mary. It's not because you're you're gonna you're gonna depend upon your relatives when you have no way. I'm not saying you can't ask you, you can't talk to them, but your trust is ultimately in God. You know your boss doesn't pay your bill. They're a tool of God. God can do without your boss. Don't let him take you into immorality. Take you out of church. But my God shall supply all your need. He just chooses to use certain things. Okay? And God gets the glory for meeting your needs. And God's the one you depend upon. And, 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 and you understand, we, we, some trust in horses and some in chariots, but we trust in the Lord. But wait a minute, don't you need horses and chariots for the war? Yeah, God uses the swords and God uses the arrows and God uses the horses and chariots. But ultimately it's God. Amen. One wild arrow and you can have the best chariot and everything in the world and you're dead. And you can have every airbag so you're like inside of a marshmallow in your car. But without God, there's no safety. And I'm not saying I'm glad to, to company me this car well and thank the Lord I was able to buy a, a car with, that had this safety thing and thank the Lord I just happened to swerve a little. Give glory to God. Make your prayers to God. Depend upon God. Pastor and I were talking today about how we can get people not overseas not to depend on us. Because we're not God. And pastors will treat us and depend upon us more than they'll depend upon God. And we've got to avoid that because it's separate for the Lord. <clears throat> Let me see a few Psalms and, and I'll give you one last thought. Psalms, I just want you to remember that this, is a, this, this altar of incense was made up for God and for his glory. Psalm chapter 20. Let me just hit a few here. And it's God, and it's just, it's, it's just for him. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 20. And verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 62. Psalm 62. David had mighty men. David is a tough guy, yet... What does he say in verse 6? He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength. My refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. <clears throat> Psalm 73. This is a separated sacrifice. This is a separated mixture. It's a separated thing just for God. Psalm 73. <clears throat> and verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is a strength of my heart and my portion forever. I thank God for all these good members and hard, they work hard, they do all kinds of ministry and do a bunch of things, but I am not dependent upon any member. People come and people go. People die. People move. It's God's church. I, I trust in him. I don't trust in people. If we have to have some meet, need met, that's fine. I, 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 if God uses people, but God can do however he wants. And, and we've got to go and realize that all prayer really goes to God. And all glory and all praise really goes to him. This prayer should be separated. It's just for God. And I want to say... Your prayer time should be separated. Let me take it to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. <clears throat> I think this can help as you come up with revival because if a church can get praying in, in a new level, it just changes everything. Most churches fail because of a lack of prayer. You might say, no, it's because they don't go soul winning. They probably, if they prayed, they'd probably go soul winning. Their hearts would, they would start beating with the heartbeat of God. God would stir some people. There's just no power there because there's no prayer. 
You want the power of the Holy Spirit? Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Yes, right. Prayer is a key to open all the doors. Right. Who is the devil stole from you? What has the devil stole in your life? That you've got to be avenge your adversary through prayer. Matthew 6, and uh, let's go to, let's hit verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which seeth in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. <laughs> prayer <laughs> all these years people you know in Bible college and to now why can't I pray successfully I'll ask two questions I already know the answers to both of them <laughs> where do you pray at I don't know just you know sometimes in my car sometimes okay second question when do you pray oh man I try to whenever I get a chance do you go to work like that what time do you go to work? 7 o'clock? You don't, I try to if I get a chance, if nothing comes up? No, I have to be at work. Okay. Thou, when thou prayest. If you don't have a prayer time, you don't schedule it, you're too busy. You're not the guy walking behind the mule for three hours. Your mind, and, and all of us have ADD. Every American has it. Your mind can't focus long enough. You know how you pray, right? Here's what you do. You say, Dear Lord, I pray for Mary. Lord, Mary, really, she, she's going to be going in for surgery. And Mary, you know what? Bob wasn't with Mary Sunday. I wonder where Bob is. And Bob was supposed to go fishing with me next week. I forgot to call him. Oh, man, and, and fishing. Oh, that reminds me of the, the, the garage, the disaster. Oh, man, I got to get, my wife told me to clean the garage. I told her I would. Oh, man, and, and. Ah, oh, Mary, and, and then your mind's not on prayer anymore. Right? Right? Because right? you're totally ADD like I am. Yeah. <laughs> you're. And your mind wanders. I have to pray out loud in my, because there's a closet prayer time. It says, shut the door. Right. Enter into that closet. That's your place. Jesus had a mountain he prayed on. Where do you pray? Doesn't matter. It's got to be private, though. It says, enter into that closet and shut the door. That means you tune everything out. Because if you don't tune everything out, you will get phone calls. You will get your kids coming and saying, can I have ice cream? You will have a million different interruptions and everything's going to happen. And it is not separated. You've got to go and be alone with God and turn everything off. Turn everything off. Your phone does have an off button. And shut the door. Make it a separated prayer time. And I'm with, I, 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 we talked about it, praying without ceasing. I think you throw things up all day long. Talk to God when you're driving. Talk to God when you're, when you're at work. Talk to God when you're, when you're eat, before you eat your food and why you're eating your food. And just talk to God all the time. Great. Do that. But there's a different type of prayer here. Yeah. The closet prayer has to be separated. You gotta have a time, you gotta have a place, and you gotta turn everything off. And you know you're gonna think, I gotta have my phone there, because you're an addict. Because you think, you know, President Biden's gonna get a phone call about the Chinese are gonna nuke America, and you gotta answer every phone call and every text, and what they're gonna ask you what to do. You just think you have to. I have to be there. Did you ever survive without a cell phone when you were younger? Right? You made it. Did you ever just not just... <laughs> Look, I, I, I pastor our church. I am overseeing six churches right now overseas. We, have, we just started church two weeks ago overseas. And, and, and I've got a lot of things going on. I'm busy as, as, as many of you are. My phone will go off all the time. <laughs> and it's serious stuff sometimes. But if I'm not with God, I can't deal with the serious stuff. 
I don't have the answers I need or the wisdom I need. Me minus an hour is much more effective than me with my whole 24 hours. And it's not working for you when you don't pray. And, and I'm saying you can go to that person who's away from God, you can give them the best lecture. And they say, I don't care. Because their heart's not convicted. Because not you did not have a good enough argument. An unsafe relative just still won't listen. It's not because you haven't witnessed to him well enough. You didn't hand him the right track. It's because God has not touched their heart yet. There's, there's more than just another method. And you've got to go and get serious about prayer. Can, if Florence gets reached and you're having thousands of people moving here and it's not going to be because you have the most beautiful building, the most handsome pastor. You're not going to, that's already in Kent, Washington, but, but you're, you're not going to, it's not going to be because you have, why are my people laughing at that? They should have amened at that point. And, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but it's going to be because you're praying. And, and if you think God's going to bypass the prayer thing and say, well, you're not, you're not going to pray, but I'm going to bless you anyway. Well, he might as well not have that altar or the incense if he'd have known your good doctrine there. Right. You got to pray. But it's, you got to separate to do it. And it's not easy, is it? Because the devil fights it. But that's the altar all the time. Keep it lit all the time. Morning and evening. Light it. Check on it. Let it go up all the time. And go there and don't sacrifice anything on that thing. That thing's... You're going to bring the atonement once a year. You'll take the, the blood from in there and you'll sprinkle it on there to sanctify it. Okay? That's just a picture in forgiveness and salvation and, 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 and you know, God washing away your sin. But you don't do anything on that thing. That thing is just the prayers of the saints. And you've got to light the incense. Uh, the incense, if, if, if this three foot, 18 by 18 inch altar if we had your altar in front of the church tonight and we just showed a fast motion of the last three months of your altar, would it be always lit and always a sweet-smelling savor going up to God? Because we need to light the incense. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for the word. Lord, you give us so much in there and there's so many things, Lord, and just so much in Hebrews about just how amazing prayer is and what an open door you gave us. But Lord, the devil fights prayer. And we're in a busy culture that takes our minds everywhere and things interrupt us all the time. May, Lord, we get serious about this. And may the people who are struggling with their guilt and with not really believing that, that Jesus paid it all and that aren't going boldly, may they begin to go boldly. We pray, Lord, for your help. And that this church and our church, the people who are here, that all of us would light the incense and our altars would be filled. And boy, that smell would drive the devil away and transform some people. Thank you for the word tonight. And I pray you'd use it in our lives and help us, Lord, each one to light the incense in our altar. We ask this in Jesus' name. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.